mute until I start getting asked questions. All right. Hi, friends. I see that we've got some folks joining. I'm so excited that you're with us. We're going to wait a few, um, a minute, uh, maybe two, just to see, um, to let people get on board and join us. So you can see we're up to 30, 32 participants. So thank you all very much for taking time out of this really pretty Palm Sunday afternoon to be with us. And we've got um, with us helping me put this on because I am Zoom challenged, but I've got a number of our staff people helping me with this today. Um, Eric Travis is doing most of the behind the scenes technical uh, work. Thank you, Eric. And Vicki Hess, um, also from um, my staff, is going to be helping um, corralling questions and sending those to our panelists. And Canon Joanne Hardy is with us as well, also working with questions. Um, so I'm delighted that they're able to do that. Um, let's see, we're a couple of minutes before. There we are, we're at seven o'clock. Um, so welcome all of you. My name's Bonnie Perry and I'm the Bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of Michigan. And I know that most of you know that because you've tuned in because you're a part of our diocese. So thank you very much. In the midst of this pandemic, what I was hoping to do by having our guests, um, Dr. Abram Wagner and Dr. Meredith Hill um, as panelists is there are lots of ways for us to get information about the COVID virus. But what I thought might be interesting is to have medical professionals, scientists meet with us today who also are people of faith, um, parishioners in our diocese, and, um, and I thought they might be able to offer us a unique perspective. So what we're gonna do with this uh, call is if you have a question that you would like one of our panelists to answer, then go ahead and put it in the question and A, the Q and A um, function. If you open that up, um, it, the screen will pop up to the side and feel free to write a question in there and we'll try to get to those. What I'm gonna do for our time together, and we'll run about, um, about an hour or so, is um, have Dr. Wagner and Dr. Hill introduce themselves, um, tell us a little bit about their passion and then some of their specific area of expertise and then um, have some questions and hopefully be able to answer some of your questions, listen to some of your um, comments and your thoughts in, in the midst of this. So I'm gonna begin us with prayer and then we'll go from there. And so the Lord be with you. And let us pray. Gracious, ever-living, ever-loving God, in the midst of a world in crisis, we ask that you continue to enfold us with your love, that you ground us, that you give us compassion and courage for the living of these days, and wisdom and insight. And we thank you for Abram and Meredith and the wisdom and the insights that they bring to us. Gracious God, be with all of our first responders, all of our medical professionals and all the people uh, in our grocery stores and gas stations and everywhere who are literally all of these people who are putting their lives at risk by going to work and helping helping all of us. But in particular tonight, we remember our medical professionals who are, have a calling to care and are living out that calling in amazing, unusual circumstances. Gracious God, please bless them. In your holy name, we pray. Amen. All right, thank you all. So um, we have um, Dr. Uh, Abram Wagner with us. And Abram is a research assistant professor of epidemiology 
at um, the University of Michigan. And our other person we have with us um, excited is Dr. Meredith Hill. And Meredith um, is the medical director at the emergency department at Sparrow Hospital, which is in Lansing. So um, Dr. Wagner, tell us, tell us a tiny bit about yourself, if you would. Sure. Um, well, first off, I'm a parishioner at St. Clair's in Ann Arbor. Um, I've been studying infectious diseases in China for 10 years. Uh, I started off doing graduate work on measles outbreaks. Um, I did a postdoc and a Fulbright scholarship studying hepatitis. Uh, more recently, I'm studying HPV and pneumonia in China and influenza in Nicaragua. Um, and I'm interested in why people are getting disease, who's getting disease, and then what are some policies and programs we can put into place to reduce the instance of disease. Thank you. How, um, and I'll go back to that in a second. And Dr. Dr. Hill, tell us a little bit about yourself, a little bit more than just the byline I gave you. Well, thanks. Yeah, I'm um, also a parishioner at St. Clair's uh, in Ann Arbor. And um, yeah, I'm currently a practicing emergency medicine physician at Sparrow Hospital in Lansing. Um, they're a level one trauma center, and I'm also responsible for the department. Um, I'm the medical director there and the chair, which basically means I'm kind of in charge of the daily operations, the safety um, of our patients and staff. Um, you know, this um, hiring and basically just making sure that the department is running smoothly. Um, I went to medical school in Philadelphia, and um, afterwards I spent time doing my residency at Henry Ford Wyandotte Hospital, and I worked there for about 11 years before going to Sparrow. Great. Oh, and I'm also the mother of two really awesome kids, um, <laughs> Beckon and Rowan. They're nine and just newly 13. So that's um, a big part of my job, too. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and if you would, um, tell me, um, tell me, um, Dr. Wagner, how'd you, how'd you decide, you know, I want to do epidemiology. That's what I want to do. Tell me, tell me how you came to that, um, that calling. Sure. So uh, I was pre-med in college, um, like many people who are science oriented. Um, I did an internship at a hospital and I absolutely hated it. Um, so I came to public health because I was really interested in this field of medicine, but I just could not see myself as a physician. And bless everyone who is able to do that, but that just is not the skill set that I have. Uh, so what I've done in my career is I've been interested in what are the disparities? Like why do some people get disease and some people do not? Uh, and so when we think of this outbreak right now, um, in Michigan here, we see there's these racial disparities where it's much um, higher incidence in African Americans compared to white Michiganders. And why is that the case? So it's, those questions just are very interesting to me. Um, and I think if we study them, then we can also think about what are some solutions to these problems. Like what can we do on a population level to alleviate the burden of disease, um, particularly among those who are most affected? Great, thank you. And um, Dr. Hill, how, how'd you come to emergency medicine? Well, that's a good question. I, um, I never really pictured myself in emergency medicine, um, but I went to medical school and I thought maybe I wanted to do internal medicine and specialize from there. I honestly, I thought, oh, that seems really scary. You have to make decisions really quickly and how could you possibly you know, do that? So. Um, but then I had my first emergency medicine rotation and I was like, ah, this is it. This, this is, this is my jam. I love it. Um, it was just, you know, you kind of get the first crack at a problem. You get to try to start figuring it out before anybody else. And, um, and it's different. Every day is different. And, um, um, yeah, and the day goes by really fast. So, um, that's how I chose emergency medicine. And you did some study, didn't you do some, um, aren't pandemics something that you did a fair amount of study in? Well, mostly just overall like disaster medicine, um, yeah. disaster medicine, disaster preparedness. Um, during residency, I took some basic and advanced um, disaster life support classes and did some teaching to the local EMS 
crews on like toxicology and exposures and how to treat them in the field. Um, we also had a really great disaster preparedness team at Henry Ford Wyandotte where I came from before um, and a great partnership with our local fire departments. And um, we regularly had a bunch of staff that would go to Anniston, Alabama for intense week long disaster training. And that was through the um, Center for Domestic Preparedness and Homeland Security. And that was just, that was like the coolest thing. That, that was so cool. Um, and I just really enjoy, you know, being part of the emergency management teams at, at both hospitals that I've been at. Um, you know, we take part in regular drills because that's just part of training and being, you know, in the ER and being in a hospital. We do all sorts of drills from like small scale chemical exposures to caring for, you know, pretend victims from a bomb blast or nuclear radiation exposures. Um, we've done active shooter drills and mass casualty drills and things like that. This seems like fairly good preparation for what we're in the middle of. Um, I, um, Dr. Abram, going back to you, would you tell us a little bit about the science of, of this virus, of COVID-19? And, um, and, and your sense of it. And also you've had that experience of, of studying a fair amount in China. Um, just um, some of your take on the Chinese response and anything that you think is gonna be helpful for us. Sure, yeah, definitely. I'll start with basically a recap. And I think this is something which everyone who's watching the news, we hear this all the time, but um, Coronaviruses are something which have been with us for a long time. We've known about them for about uh, half a century. They can cause the common cold along with some other viruses and they circulate a lot in humans. There's a lot of different strains of them. And they also circulate in animals as well. And sometimes there's been these crossover events where there's been some strain of coronavirus which has moved from an animal species into a human species. And um, at least within the past 20 years, there's been three events where this has resulted in a very serious disease spreading in the human population. So in 2002, SARS um, from southern China, that was a coronavirus, uh, it caused a very severe disease, uh, but we don't see SARS anymore. There's been no cases of SARS in, in over a decade. Uh, there is MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, and in 2012, there was a crossover event where it went from some animal species in Saudi Arabia into humans. And we see sporadic cases of that. It's not very um, infectious. It's very severe if you get it, but it just doesn't spread very easily. Um, and certainly now we have in the past year, there's been COVID-19. So this coronavirus disease, it has been spreading and it originated in central China. Um, and it's been now, you know, going throughout the globe. Um, it's very interesting because about a couple months ago, some colleagues in Shanghai were talking to me about COVID-19 um, and they were, we were starting to do some studies on it and it just seemed to me this interesting infectious disease which was happening in China and little did I know that, you know, a few weeks later it would be hitting the United States very hard um, and right now there's, I think, three to four times as many cases in Michigan than there ever were in Shanghai, which is this huge metropolis, which is only about um, a couple hours high-speed train ride away from Wuhan. So certainly there's been different, the epidemiology of disease has been, been different in China than it is in other countries. And um, as uh, attendees have questions, I'm happy to talk a bit more about that. But I thought um, I would talk about where, where we are now, what do we know, and then what do we potentially know about the future? Because those are the questions that all of us are thinking about. So COVID-19 is relatively infectious, probably a bit more so than the flu, um, but we think it's mostly spread through droplets. So sort of these like invisible but heavy um, liquid droplets from your mouth or from your nose, which you exhale or you sneeze or you cough out, um, and then they land somewhere um, within a three feet diameter from where you are. Um, so we think it's mostly that close contact is the way that you can get COVID-19. Um, but the problem is that the virus can survive on surfaces um, for a few days for hard surfaces. And uh, so like if you touch surfaces and then touch your face, that's a really good way to transmit disease to yourself. But also if you have an infection, it's very easy if you touch your face to kind of get some 
get some goop which has this virus and then spread it into any surface which you touch. So the reason why we're saying try not to touch many things and try not to touch your face is both to prevent disease, prevent you from getting an infection, but also if you have an infection, to prevent it from going to somebody else. Um, but so I was saying, you know, it can survive for a few days on hard surfaces, but on clothes, on, on poor surfaces like cardboard, probably a bit less than that, maybe only about a day. Um, so here in the United States, we are under a stay at home order for most of the population and certainly here in Michigan. Um, and I think many people are wondering, we've been at, we've been under a stay at home order for a couple weeks now, why are cases going up? Like, why are there more and more cases? That's an understandable confusion. And that's just something that I really want to direct to people because staying at home is one of the most important things that you can do to limit the spread of disease. Uh, but there's certain people who cannot stay at home. You know, if you're a physician like uh, Dr. Hill, you need to go into work and treat patients. Um, there's some frontline people, you know, people who work at grocery stores. Uh, who just like we need those people out in the world. So as much as possible that the rest of us who aren't, it's not needed for us to go outside, you know, we staying inside is really important. Um, so why are the cases keeping on going up even if we have these stay at home orders which should be effective? One is there's an incubation period. So people who are infected um, a while back, like a week or so back, could still be getting disease now. So it takes a while for the disease um, symptoms to, to start up. There's also often a lag time between when you start having disease and then when you get tested. And there's, all the, the, there's been all sorts of news articles about how difficult it is to get testing. Um, certainly you could infect other people in your home. So even if you are in this stay at home shelter in place order, you could be infecting other family members. Um, and certainly like the people who have to go out into the community, uh, they can be starting to um, get infected as well. So where do we go from here? Certainly the end goal is to get a vaccine. There's um, a number of really promising um, vaccine candidates which are being studied here in the United States and other countries, um, but we're probably not going to get that onto the market until the end of 2021. And that's just because these uh, vaccines are, they have to be very safe before we get them to market. So they have to go through a number of different studies. And even if we remove all the red tape and all the red tape has been removed for these studies. Um, it just takes a long time to enroll these people into these studies and to, um, to look at them for a period of time to see, is the vaccine safe? And then did they get the disease or not? So that'll take some time. So what do we do before we get the vaccine? Um, so right now we're under this very strict stay at home order. Uh, and the goal of that is to drive case counts down and maybe we will get to a situation where there's pretty much zero cases here in the United States and in other countries as well. That would obviously be the ideal scenario, which would be like in a month or so, just um, not have any more cases of disease. That's probably highly unlikely given that there's been such global spread of this disease. Uh, so what are other things which could happen? Um, one is that we could, just see this become more of a seasonal occurrence where, you know, every year it kind of comes back into the United States and then um, after a couple months it kind of sp spreads out of the United States and goes to some other country. Um, and so, you know, kind of like influenza. So uh, that's something which could happen. I think kind of the best case scenario going forward is that we um, drive the case counts pretty low, but then um, we lift this stay at home order and then what we have are really rigorous contact tracing investigations so that the moment that somebody in a community gets um, COVID-19, gets coronavirus, we can isolate them and we can quarantine any of their contacts for the past um, couple days. And that's been something which had worked relatively successfully in South Korea for a while. I think in the United States, we've just had um, some limitations with our testing and uh, coronavirus has just sort of gotten a bit out of control for us just to be solely relying on that. But in the future, if our case counts go down, then um, certainly that's something that we could return to. Uh, so I think I will leave it at that, but certainly I'd be interested to um, see what kind of questions the attendees have. Yeah. Um, when we, um, one question, um, you were talking about droplets. 
I know there's been a lot of talk about aerosols at this point. And then, and I think, isn't that some of the thought behind the CDC guidelines for wearing masks in public? Um, yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so we've thought for the past couple months when um, studying COVID-19 coronavirus is that it's predominantly spread through these droplets. So these heavy things which just kind of land very quickly on a surface. Um, the concern would be, could they be aerosolized? So could there be airborne transmission? So for instance, for measles, if somebody sneezes and then goes away and in a couple hours, somebody goes into that room, there's still measles virus hanging out in the air and somebody could easily get infected. Um, that could be, that might be the case with COVID-19. We don't have rigorous evidence for it at this point in time. The problem is that it's, it's kind of a hard thing to prove. Um, but as we do more and more studies, we might figure that out a bit more. I think a big concern right now is that um, you can transmit the disease while still being asymptomatic or maybe what we'd call pre-symptomatic. So um, you don't have large or really serious symptoms, but you're still um, potentially spreading disease when you are just going about your day, um, like exhaling air, things like that. So. I think that could potentially be a concern. One thing also, just even light symptoms, like having a small sore throat in some of the research I've done, that has been related to the spread of the disease. So um, there's been a lot of confusing messaging from the government on whether you should wear masks. And I will say that talking to my Chinese colleagues, um, everyone there is just wearing a mask. So it's like a very different environment in Asia where the governments are encouraging people to wear masks. And I think in some areas it's even required when you go out to wear masks. Whereas here in the United States and in most of Europe, we're not really requiring people to wear masks. Um, so masks probably don't prevent you from getting the disease. So you could still breathe in viruses if somebody in the nearby was like exhaling or coughing it. Um, and certainly if you know you have a mask on and you're like touching things and then touching your mouth underneath the mask, obviously the mask isn't going to work then. But the mask is probably those cloth masks. And again, no one at this point should be wearing fancy surgical masks or N95s because we have shortages of those. But for cloth masks, which you could make with your sewing machine, um, and there's lots of designs online, those are probably a bit effective at stopping these droplets from going from you if you were infected out towards other people. So I could see us moving into a direction where this becomes a bit more common and a bit more commonplace just as a way to limit the spread of disease. Um, because especially a lot of people, they might not feel like they're sick, but they still could be um, shedding virus. Great, thank you. Thank you. That's, that's super helpful. Um, Dr. Hill, tell us about um, preparations, your, um, and, and just sort of now what's going on in our hospitals, what you're anticipating at Sparrow, when you're anticipating peak, um, and, and then maybe sort of the progression of the disease. We, we know that many people die. We know that, or a number of people die. We know that a number of people can get the disease have flu-like symptoms and then get over it. Um, I'm, I'm kind of curious about the people who are going into the hospital and getting on vent ventilators and are they coming off? And so, but give us, give us an overview of um, what you're preparing for and, um, and what um, is happening with folks. If you yeah, might. so um, so right now, I mean, really our focus is just to be as prepared as we can for the influx of patients that we're going to have. Um, you know, we want to make sure that we keep our staff safe with the right equipment, um, and we want to make sure that when patients come in, we're giving them the best treatment possible when they come into the emergency department and then into the hospital. Um, you know, I guess as as to speak a little bit towards the training that I was talking about before, you know, we train for mass casualty incidents, right? Meaning a large influx of patients over a brief period of time. But, you know, the difference between that and this is this is almost like a mass casualty incident that we're gonna have to deal with for months. It's just gonna keep occurring. Um, and, 
And with that, we do have to worry about running out of supplies, um, you know, and making sure that our, our caregivers have what they need to care for everybody. So, you know, that's definitely been a big part of our preparations is sourcing this equipment that we need. Um, and I did see a, a comment that I can answer. I mean, as far as our site in particular, we're in good shape right now for our, um, our what we call PPE, our personal protective equipment. Um, specifically, you know, we need to make sure that we have those N95 masks. And those N95 masks are important um, for us because we have patients that are undergoing procedures that can aerosolize the virus. So like if you've ever seen anybody have like a breathing treatment for asthma, that aerosolizes the virus. Um, you know, so procedures like that, we have to make sure we have the right equipment for. And, you know, as, as Dr. Wagner was talking about before, there's also droplet spread. So we need to cover our bodies and cover ourselves so those droplets don't get on us. So we need gowns and gloves and um, face shields. Um, to be able to protect us properly. So, so there's been a lot of sourcing of that um, because you've, I'm sure you've heard, uh, there are places that don't have adequate equipment. And when you don't have adequate equipment, then you know, the caregivers will get sick. Um, in some places, about 20% of the workforce has become ill and unable to care for other patients. So, you know, there's been a lot of innovation around this, um, which has been kind of cool. Um, you know, talking about repurposing N95 masks and how to do that. Um, at our site, uh, we're labeling our N95 masks so that we know that they belong, you know, this one belongs to me and I'm in the emergency department. And they've actually partnered with MSU and the food science, um, uh, you know, labs and they're actually doing a heating method of being able to um, clean the N95s and repurpose them and give them back. So there's all sorts of different ways out there. Some are doing like hydrogen peroxide, some are doing UV light and things like that. So definitely the innovation has been pretty interesting. Um, you know, the other aspect of the supply is, well, how quickly are you going through it? So, you know, currently, you know, because we look at our burn rate. So every day we look at our burn rate and then, you know, that affects how quickly we're going to go through our supply. So if you're not seeing that many um, respiratory patients, then you're not going to be going through quite as much um, gear. So that's something we have to keep a close eye on. Um, we definitely haven't hit our peak out there yet. Um, you know, I, I have a lot of colleagues and partners in Detroit area that are definitely feeling the brunt of this right now. Um, and so, you know, we're talking with all of them. We're talking with the folks in Detroit. We're talking with the folks in New York City, um, those in Washington State, and even in Italy, just to learn from their experiences because this is pretty new and, and there's new information out almost every day or every week um, on the virus and how to treat it um, and how it behaves. So I guess we, I sort of feel like right now we have the luxury in this, we're calling it kind of the calm before the storm, um, right now where we can have that time to prepare. Our, our patient volumes have been down um, for better or for worse. People are staying away from the emergency department. We're seeing about half the patients we normally see uh, in a given day. Um, and so that has allowed us a little bit of, you know, breathing room, a little bit of time that I can, you know, rest some of our physicians and um, advanced practice, you know, providers so that we can save them up, limit their exposure now because we're probably going to need them in the coming weeks. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think what Dr. Wagner said, you know, he hit the nail right on the head. I mean, you have to stay home. You just, you, you have to stay home. I mean, you know, the people out there, people call us the, the frontline staff, but actually everybody out there is the frontline staff. Everyone out there is, you are in the front lines. And, and your job is to, to stay home, keep yourself safe, um, keep everybody else around you safe. Um, we're the last line of defense. If you make it to us, <laughs> you know, then that means that something along the way went wrong and you got exposed. So, you know, it's, and it's empowering, you know, to everybody out there, you can make a difference. Everybody out there can make a difference by, you know, following those guidelines and, and trying to stay home. What, um, um... Dr. Hill, what, for, for the Lansing area, when do you expect, a, um, when do you expect an increase? 
Good question. They've done, you know, modeling and forecasting. And I know, you know, the University of Michigan has done it as well. Um, and I believe we're using sort of a similar model as, as the University of Michigan. And of course, all models are dependent on so many things, so many variables. Um, a lot of it is dependent on social distancing and if that happens or if it doesn't. Um, you know, really hard to say, but um, the peak is, they're predicting is probably going to be I guess in about four weeks, four to five weeks would be the peak. Um, but again, that's all dependent on all sorts of. And, and do you, so four to five weeks, um, but here in Detroit, when do we, is that a closer peak? Or oh, yeah, they're, they're much further along. Much further along. But so in, in the next week, two weeks, week? For Detroit? Yeah. I don't know when, I haven't seen their predictive modeling to see exactly what they think their peak is. Um, that, we've got a question here and I'm curious about it, um, that all the beds that are being put in the, um, in the, is in the, the TCF center. Um, and like, so where's the hospital staff going to come from for that? Yeah, that's a great question. So that is what we would call an alternate care site. Um, so an alternate care site is a site that's set up in preparation or, you know, because you've run out of beds at your normal hospital. Um, so yeah, they're looking for staff to be able to staff that. Um, they're going to have the less acute patients, so like not the ICU type patients requiring that really critical care. Um, but what they're doing is, you know, a lot of internal medicine physicians and a lot of family practice physicians who, you know, their practices are very slow right now or even, you know, potentially closed, um, they're offering to come and help. Um, you know, there's also a surge of physicians and um, nurses and um, nurse practitioners and physician assistants from all over the country that are willing to travel and, and help out. So we're kind of pulling from, you know, both local and national resources. And I know that um, the Cathedral of St. John the Divine in New York City is going to be an, al an, uh, an alternate hospital um, sanctuary there, um, which is super interesting. I mean, it's a huge sanctuary, but um, um, yeah. Creative. Yeah, not, not exactly what I think the, the liturgist thought could see coming. Um, what, um, tell us a little bit about the progression of the disease, if you might. Yeah, sure. So um, the, you can have sort of, you know, mild disease or, um, you know, more moderate and then progressing to the very significant, um, more severe disease. So the mild disease, you kind of have upper respiratory symptoms, um, you know, sore throat, maybe a little bit of a, you know, runny nose, cough, body aches, you, you kind of feel like you have the flu. Um, then it can kind of go into the lungs and you can have, you know, it affect your lungs. Usually it's, it's um, you have an effect on both sides of the lungs rather than the pneumonia that we're kind of used to, you know, it's just usually affects like one side or one little area of the lung. So you can get into that non-severe pneumonia and then it can progress um, into the severe pneumonia with um, like a respiratory distress syndrome. And in those cases, you could end up, you know, on the ventilator and in the ICU. Um, but really the most common symptoms, you know, most people just have a very mild or mild to moderate form of the disease, uh, especially the younger population. And the most common symptoms really are the cough, fever, um, some experience shortness of breath, and they're actually seeing that um, you can have concurrent, you know, GI symptoms like nausea, vomiting, diarrhea that can go along with it as well. And, and then, so the disease runs its course, and then if you're able to maintain respiration, then the disease runs its course and you gradually can recover? Yes. If that is severe? Yes. Case? if you've been attended to? Yes, and most people do recover. The people that we worry about are, you know, folks over 60, um, those that have diabetes or any cardiovascular disease, you know, hypertension, um, or if you have underlying lung problems like asthma or COPD, 
um, those people that are the ones that we would tend to worry about more. Thank you. I'm, I'm seeing some, some questions here. Um, one of the ones is about, um, and maybe um, Dr. Wagner or Dr. Hill, you want to, uh, either one of you can chime in on this, but it, it's, this one is right now the Michigan stay at home order expires next week, April 14th, but it's expected to be extended. How long do you feel it should be extended, if at all? So I think this is where you get to play not research scientist or a medical doctor, but um, you get to be um, a politician, perhaps. Um, but what do you think, guys? How, how long should it be there? Meredith, is that the interna international? I don't want that question. <laughs> yes, but not it's fine. Yeah. I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll start. Um, so in China, which has one, I, I'll also mention somebody was wondering how much can we trust the Chinese government from their statistics? And I'm not a historian. I'm not also a politician who knows exactly what's going on in the higher levels of the Chinese government. But I will say the people who I work with who are kind of lower level bureaucrats in the Chinese Department of Health and then also academicians, um, they're taking this very seriously and they are working really hard at their jobs. Uh, but they had an experience where basically they've had a very strict shutdown for two months from the um, end of January through the end of um, March, and they're slowly easing it right now. Um, and I can't see any circumstance where we wouldn't have to at least do something similar to that. Um, and to be honest, we started our shelter in place, our stay at home orders much later than the Chinese side did. So it might be that we would have to be even larger. What I'm saying to my parents is don't plan on anything this summer. I'm hoping, you know, being at the university, I'm hoping that um, starting in September, we can start our new semester fresh. But really, I think this summer will be mostly a wash. Um, I think, but like the rigorous, the strict like stay at home orders, again, I don't know what the government's gonna say, but I would suggest at least doing it through May um, and if the case counts aren't going down, then at least doing it through um, June as well. Thank you. There's also a super interesting question here about um, the mutation rate on this, on this virus. I know that some of the other um, uh, coronaviruses would mutate once or twice and frequently mutated to be more benign. Um, but that is this one mutating much? Do you know? And which way is it going? Yeah, so I think um, mutations people think a lot about in like the sci-fi context of, oh, it's mutating and it's going to become like much worse. Um, but really like anything evolves over time. Um, and coronaviruses are an RNA virus and kind of like influenza. And it just means that it has a type of genetic material which is very easy to mutate over time. Um, it's not as stable as like the DNA that we have in our genome. Um, so it, I'm sure it is mutating at this point in time. I've seen lots of um, diagrams showing this. I'm not seeing that as a particular concern for whether this is going to be more serious or more benign. I'm a bit more concerned if we're developing vaccine candidates right now, which maybe in a couple of years when they're ready, might not be as effective because they're based on um, a strain of coronavirus, which has since uh, mutated a bit. That, um, that makes sense. Um, what do you think, tell us about this notion uh, about the second wave. Um, and I don't know if that's a Dr. Hill or a Dr. Wagner question. And, and for folks who don't know, just give a tiny background on that, but. So um, I'll do what I think it means, um, but I would be also interested to hear what Dr. Hill's perspective. So first off, there's this idea that there's this peak of people who have infections right now and who need critical care, but then there's maybe like a second peak where people have, um, they're thinking of like the after effects of that, like maybe they've had pneumonia for a bit and then need to be like admitted to chronic care and like after staying at home for a bit with disease and then all of a sudden they need to be moved to a hospital. Um, and then you could think of like third and fourth wave when you think of people right now who have chronic diseases or who kind of are waiting to go to a hospital, um, but eventually there'll be kind of like a bottleneck of them needing to get care. Um, and then of course there's all sorts of like economic effects as well. So uh, really this is all to say that 
Um, I think there will be huge pressures on the hospital systems for a while, but they might impact like different sectors depending on who's needing care. But I, I might be misinterpreting the question, but I think that's, that's what my understanding is. Yeah, I think my interpretation of the second wave would be, um, you know, so we're all sheltering in place right now and, and, and trying to do that. Um, we're going to see a peak. And then the concern is, I think, if we allow everyone to, you know, to lift those restrictions, then we're going to kind of reinfect everyone um, if we do that too soon. I think that's what the second wave um, is referring to. And that, that is definitely something that I, I do worry about. Um, I would hope that um, we're really thoughtful about when we feel that it is safe to lift those restrictions. Um, oh, okay. Here's one from, this is from Beth Anderson. A story broke this afternoon that a tiger in the Bronx Zoo tested positive for COVID-19. I just want to know where they're getting the testing kits for the tigers and we're not getting them here. A anyway, because we're the tigers. We have a tiger, right? Anyway, after coming, okay, with the asymptomatic care tip, are there any implications for the course of this, this infection? Friends? Um, so I'll just mention, so some people have concerns that like maybe their cat or their dog will get coronavirus. And like I said, coronavirus is circulated in all sorts of animals, but generally they're like species specific. So there's like the bat coronaviruses, there's the um, like the cat ones, things like that. Um, so I'm not super worried about infecting animals. You know, I have two cats and one is like running wild around this room. So I'm sorry if it's noisy, but uh, Oftentimes, you, it depends on like how you're testing them because there's been, there were some initial tests where people were finding out that like their cat or dog had um, coronavirus, but really it's probably because the human is just like coughing and exhaling a lot and some like lands on the animal, but the animal's not really getting sick. It just kind of has it on its surfaces. Uh, so I'm not exactly sure what that's, what's up with this, with this uh, tiger at all. And I, I'm not super concerned about like it going into an animal reservoir and then coming back to the humans. I think our focus right now should be on limiting what's happening in humans. And I think that the rest will follow with how it's being spread to animals and whatnot. Thank you. Um, what are you thinking about um, uh, post-immunity? Uh, immunity post-infection. I know that in Italy, there was an article about people going back to work, but they were saying you might need the right antibodies to go back to work, meaning you'd already been exposed to the virus. And then, so you weren't, you, you, your chances were of contracting again were much lower. Um, and, and that gets me thinking, oh my goodness, do I need to go get a tiny case of it? And, and so, because this is how my brain works, but I'd, I'd love to know some folks who have more than a bachelor's degree in biology take, think about that. Um, I could, wait, wait um, do you, okay, I'll, I'll go really quick and then I'll have I'll, Dr. Hill follow. Um, so first off, don't try to go to a coronavirus party and get it yourself. Like wait for the vaccine to, vaccine Good. to thank you, thank happen. you. Good. Um, so that's one thing, there's, there's, I, I think once you get, my gut instinct would be that like once you get the um, infection, you'll develop a pretty robust immune response and we'll be able to fight off any subsequent inf infections in the future with the asterisk that maybe it'll mutate and kind of be like influenza where every year it might like come back slightly different. Dr. Hill? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, they're still working on the, the data around this. There's just not a whole lot from what I understand, but um, and again, this isn't necessarily my field of expertise, but from what I'm understanding, you know, because of some of those mutations that have happened, it, it could be possible to be reinfected. Um, but again, not my field of expertise per se. Are, are you thinking that this is going to be something that's going to be with us, that's going to be seasonal, or is it something like the measles that we eradicate? How does, how does that work? Or who knows? Um, so I would hope, so I guess like the two things is it could become something like influenza where, you know, like every year we have to get a new vaccine for like a new strain of coronavirus, which we think is going to gonna happen. Or like you said, like, will this become something like measles where we will pretty much be able to eliminate it with the exception of um, like sporadic cases here and there. Um, 
Of course, the third possibility, which I think is increasingly unlikely, would just be that it just goes away naturally and we just don't need to worry about it ever again. Um, my gut inclination is that it'll be with us at least until we get a vaccine um, in some sort of seasonal way. But that's that's my gut inclination, looking at some models and just seeing that, you know, there's been so much um, spread in in countries all over the world. Great. Um, let's see, I'm trying to, um, can a CPAP uh, machine serve as a ventilator, Dr. Hill? So that's a great question. Um, so there are some machines in the hospital that, um, that we call, you know, BiPAP or CPAP. Um, there, are, there are some of them that can function as both a, what we call non-invasive ventilator, which would be like your CPAP or BiPAP, and they can cross over and be used as uh, more invasive ventilation where you're, you know, there's a, a tube down you and it's breathing for you. Um, so there are some of those, not all of them can cross over. Okay. And, um, and then we've got folks talking about, um, at, largely, it, it, this appears to be a standing committee question, both from um, Ann Pohalitz and Eric Williams, that they're interested in the, the, the in-between, that the, the between the shelter-in-place order and, and the vaccine. What does that in-between time um, look like? Um, what's the middle ground, the middle phase of easing back into our lives, do you think? So I'll start, um, but I'm also interested to hear what uh, Dr. Hill has to say. Um, I think that what can happen is if we get our case counts down pretty low here in Michigan, throughout the United States, um, and then also in other countries in the world, because we can't shut our borders forever like we have to have some sort of international trade going on um, and movement of peoples so i think what would happen is we'd move to an area where there still needs to be a lot of attention devoted to coronavirus but it'll mostly be trying to identify people very quickly who have disease and then isolate them and quarantine you know as many people as possible who had contact with that person um, for a period of time before that person got sick. So uh, I think it would just be intensive monitoring of the, um, of the population. So basically, instead of it being like a shelter in place for everyone, it would be a much more limited shelter in place for people who have had the disease and for their close contacts. But we're just not there with like our huge case counts right now. Right. Yeah, I would agree with what um, Dr. Wagner said. Yeah, it's going to have to get, you know, down onto that part of the curve where it's much more sporadic and we can, you know, identify and isolate those um, individual cases. It seems like ramping up the public health aspect of that, which I wonder, I wonder if that's one of our strong points in the United States. Yeah, certainly um, this is the time where people in public health are um, desperately needed to do these investigations. There's public health nurses, there's epidemiologists who are working in local health departments, working in state health departments. Um, so, so yes, I think having a strong public health system will be uh, very necessary for this next phase. Like before the vaccine, what do we do? And then we've got a question here about the connection between ibuprofen and the worsening of the virus. Um, oh, I can take that one. Yes, please, thank you. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so the, the concern about ibuprofen, which is a class of medicines called NSAIDs, um, the concern is that that could potentially worsen the virus. And the thought behind that was that um, ibuprofen might upregulate those receptors that the coronavirus enters the cell. And a lot of this was theoretical. It was like, well, this makes sense. If this does this, that should do this. And then that should happen. Um, and um, someone wrote a letter uh, or an opinion sort of piece about it. And um, then it kind of exploded from there. 
Um, to my knowledge, they still don't have any strong evidence that that is actually the case. Um, and so they haven't, you know, they basically said there's, you know, they would not recommend avoiding NSAIDs in particular in the, in, you know, COVID-19 or coronavirus. I would say the caveat to that is in general, when we have really sick patients in the ICU, we do just tend to avoid those medications anyway, because they can cause worsening kidney function. And a lot of people who are in critical condition have issues with their kidneys. Um, so in those cases, we would usually avoid it anyway, but there's no good solid evidence to show that if you have just like a mild case that that's gonna make you any worse. Thank you. That's super, super helpful. Um, what, um, and I think we, we've kind of, I'm going to ask this one more time because we have so many questions about this. So I think it's slightly different. And again, it's about the peak. And the question is here, like after the peak, how long before the rest of us get to relax? But I'm also mindful of the fact that the peak is going to be in so many different places in our country. Um, so again, one more, one more try at, at the peak. Um, when do we get to relax? And does it mean there'll be fewer cases? Or does it mean that it's, there's less of it? Or it's just easier for the, med for the healthcare system? Yeah, so that's a great question. And again, I mean, all this predictive modeling is just that. It's trying to make a prediction. And it's um, what, what we know about predictive modeling is they're usually wrong somehow. Um, so we can, we can guess, but we don't always know. And, and it really depends on what the shape of that curve looks like. So, you know, you could have a really, you know, um, quick upslope and then quick downslope. You could have one that's a little bit more gradual, um, which yeah, that would make things kind of linger on a little bit more, um, which is, you know, what they refer to when they talk about the flattening of the curve. They want to try to um, make that peak not quite so abrupt so that our healthcare systems can better handle things. But then the downside of that is, well, it's going to linger on longer. You know, this, is, this could potentially go on a little bit longer, potentially, right? Um, and and, and there, you're absolutely right. It is by region. I mean, you know, Detroit's getting hit right now, we're less than an hour away and, and we're not getting hit quite as much. And then I'm an hour west than Lansing and we're getting hit less than here, you know? So by the time Detroit gets better, we may be worse on the, on the west side of the state. So I don't know how they're gonna lift restrictions, if it's gonna be by the entire state or if it's gonna be a regional thing. Um, I'm not sure exactly how, how they make that call, um, but, yeah, it could very well be state by state within the United States. Um, yeah. And I'll just add that, um, so how China has been doing it is they've been lifting restrictions, but it's been very slow, these things which they've done. Like, I think they opened up theaters for one day, but then they're like, wait, you know, let's not do that so much. They've been opening up like certain um, public places, but they've been trying to, you know, limit the people who can come into them. So it's, it's not like fully open like it was before, but there's um, some more restrictions in place. It's sort of like a, a medium. The other thing that I want to, um, you know, mention is that people are developing immunity to the disease over time. Um, and as long as about 50% or more of the population is immune, um, we should be able to pretty quickly slow the spread of disease. The problem is that if people are becoming immune because of natural infection and because of getting severe disease, that means like a lot of people will die in that process. Um, so what Dr. Hill was saying is we're trying to extend this as long as possible, um, this process of getting so many people immune. So we're trying to extend that as much as possible so that we can get to a vaccine. So like once we get to the vaccine, then um, you know it'll be much easier to get a large proportion of the population immune. Yeah, thank you. Um, we, we've got a question about the hydroxychloroquine. Um, I'm not sure if I said that right, but are, is there are any use of that in Sparrow? I know that's going on in, in Detroit, and I know it's all, it's got some, some questions about it. So, Dr. Hill? Yeah, it's definitely a hot topic. Um, currently, um, 
I can just speak to, you know, what our site is doing. They are using it for certain um, specific patients who are admitted, who meet certain criteria. Um, you know, they're, again, they're small sort of single center studies um, that say that it could be of benefit. Um, you know, we're, we don't have the luxury of having the great big randomized controlled trials that are really more scientifically robust at this point. Um, so part of it is you really have to weigh the risks and the benefits because it does have um, a profile, a toxicity profile that you need to be careful of. It's not for every patient. And certainly it does interact with a fair amount of medications. Um, specifically, it can cause cardiac arrhythmias um, if you're on other medications that could interact with it as well. Um, that's sort of the concern with the hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin, if you've heard about those together, though that can sort of amplify the risk for that cardiac arrhythmia. So people who are taking it, you know, really need to be carefully monitored. Um, as of right now, it's not necessarily being recommended for just outpatient use, like meaning you're well enough to not be in the hospital. But I did uh, I do understand that Henry Ford is doing a clinical trial right now for first responders and um, folks to see if there is any use in um, preventative, you know, using it as a preventative. Um, so that that's going to be interesting to see that, you know, I think the one downside of this is that with it being played up and, and all this publicity about it, people are stockpiling it and the people who really need it, like the, those with uh, lupus and other rheumatic illnesses, are having a really hard time just getting their regular prescriptions. And, and it's shown to be beneficial in those patient populations and, and they can't get the medications they need, so they're suffering. So, um, so it, it may have some utility and some promise. Um, we just don't know for sure yet. That's, that's super interesting about stockpiling. Good Lord in heaven. Um, I've got one question and then I wanna transition us a little bit. I've got a question, it says, elderly are stressing that their DNR code status will prevent them from receiving COVID-19 care in the ER. Help us with that, Dr. Hill. So I, I guess if, if they are uh, DNR status, which means do not resuscitate, I mean, if that is their wish, then you know, generally we do everything we can except resuscitate because that's what they don't want. I'm, I'm wondering if that's what the question is. Um, you know, definitely there, there have been some places across the country and in other countries where um, it has been, um, you know, where they've had to go to a different standard of care because they don't have enough ventilators um, to care for these patients. And in that, in those cases, unfortunately, sometimes they have had to um, make that decision of, you know, who will get that ventilator and really that that decision comes in and who's likely to survive. Uh, you know, if somebody comes in very critically ill and, you know, um, they have to be resuscitated, chances are they're probably not going to survive with um, if they do have COVID. So those are really um, heartbreaking um, ethical dilemmas that nobody ever wants to be put in. Um, but, um, but that is happening in some places because um, the need really um, outstrips the resources, unfortunately. And um, thank you. Um, and I think this takes us on that pivot um, a little bit. How both for both of you, Dr. Hill and Dr. Wagner, how's your faith um, inform how you think about this, how you um, how you do your work? Um, I know, Dr. Hill, you're you're living with your family. You're coming and going to the hospital. I mean, how, where's your faith? How does your faith um, inform what's going on with you right now? And then, Dr. Wagner. Sorry, I just had to unmute myself there. Um, yeah, you know, um, I think in my job, you ha I have to be a realist, um, which is hard sometimes because at heart, I'm really an optimist and I really do tend to see the positive in most situations. And sometimes it's to the point where it's a little bit annoying, you know, that I'm a little bit on the positive 
patio there. Um, but you know, throughout this experience so far, what I see is I really, I see and I feel so much love and support from family and friends and strangers. And, um, and it really feels like the world and our communities are kind of coming together. Um, and I feel a great sense of humanity. And maybe that's because I don't watch TV. And so I don't know what's out there on the TV right now. So some may feel differently. But what I see is I see the neighbors helping one another, checking on each other, you know, um, socially distanced, um, making sure that everyone has what they need. Um, you know, people really wanting to help in any way they can. And that just really fills my heart um, and my soul. And, um, you know, I just, I just see everybody stepping up in so many ways to prepare for this and, um, and the bravery. And I see families acting more like family units, playing games together, singing together, going on walks together and having meals together. And, you know, suddenly life has kind of slowed down and we're really all just remembering what it is to be a family. And, and in some ways I feel like we're forging more connections, even though we're physically distant, we're somewhat more socially together. And, you know, to me that all those things are examples of goodness and light and love and faith. And those things will bring you through the extreme darkness that sometimes you feel. Thank you. Yeah. What for you, Dr. Wagner? Yeah. So um, I'm reminded of um, a few things, thinking about the faith, thinking about story, stories in the Bible and um, from my interactions with, with other people of faith. So, uh, you know, there's stories of hardship in the Bible. I think Job is a great example of this where all these bad things happen to him and he doesn't understand why. Um, and his friends come and they're saying that it must be because he's sinning and, uh, you know, there's something wrong with him. Um, and from what I get out of Job and as a theologian, um, Bishop, you might have a totally different view on this, but by the end of the book, God kind of comes out against the friends who are blaming him. And Job is kind of um, vindicated uh, from his friends. So the first thing I want to say is that I've, I've seen this kind of creep up in a number of religious contexts where people say like the virus is some response of God like towards like wrath on people. Um, and certainly that's not like part of my faith tradition. And I don't think it's part of many Episcopalians faith tradition, but um, I just want to get that out of the way that I think that that's not like biblically sound. And I also don't think that's like a humane way of dealing with the situation. But there's stories of healing in the Bible. You know, there's Elijah healing the widow's son. There's um, Paul in the New Testament, obviously Jesus raising Lazarus. Um, and what I see this is, is that God works through people. He works through the nurses. He works through the doctors, the healthcare workers, and even like the grocery store workers who are still having to go in and provide us with, with food. Um, so I think this is definitely a moment where we can see God working through other people. Um, and then the other thing I'll say is that this is a story of sacrifice. And I don't think this is articulated very well among some politicians, but I think this is a time for us to like dig down and sacrifice a bit. I don't know of anybody who's going to come through this more economically benefited. You know, we're all going to take a financial hit because of this. Um, and for some people, that's going to be a lot worse. Uh, but by us, like taking what can be like a small action, like staying inside, um, that can help other people. Um, and it reminds me of, you know, just like this, this biblical idea of us being interconnected, you know, Jesus saying, I'm the vine, you are the branches, like we're all in this together. And I think if we can think, stop thinking so much about like, how can I stop from getting disease, but start thinking like, if I had disease, and I might be asymptomatic, how can I stop it from spreading to other people? Like, what can I do to um, prevent me from like spreading to other people? How can I protect other people? And I think that's a good way of putting it. Yeah, that, um, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm struck and very um, thankful that both of you guys happen to be from St. Clair's in Ann Arbor um, and such a great congregation. And I'm so thankful that you all in the midst of your busy lives were able to take some time and and, and be with all of us. Um, one of the, the things that I um, have gone back to several times now um, is a, a book by uh, Steven Tyler, and it's called The Psychology of Pandemics, Preparing for the Next Global Outbreak of Infectious Disease. And he published it in October of 2019. So um, he was kind of right on it when he published it. But a piece in it that has really stayed with me is the notion that his research showed 
that um, church people can tend to be super carriers for a pathogen because they tend to not stop doing good and they don't always listen. Um, and, and, and which has brought me to this notion of like killing people with kindness. Um, and which is not, and I'm not, I don't ever want to confuse that with all of the folks who are doing an amazing job in keeping our community, their, our community kitchens and our food pantries and, and, and shelters going because this disease has taken the cracks in our infrastructure and the disparities in our infrastructure and I think made chasms out of them. Um, there's a lot to be said with um, uh, the issue of race in this, the issue of poverty in this, um, comorbidity and access to healthcare. It's all playing out in our, in our systems. Um, and, um, but what I really long for is for all of us who are not so good at just, um, don't just do something, sit there, to, to know that sitting there gives um, our um, other, our frontline people, frontline from all over, whether it's at our grocery store or in the emergency department, it gives those folks a, a fighting um, chance. Um, so, um, and so I, that's my hope is that we can continue to educate ourselves, that we can learn from you all and, and that we can do our very best in, in flattening this curve, um, knowing that after two weeks of staying inside or staying at home, um, we all desperately want to go out and it's only going to get warmer and nicer and we're only going to want to go out more and more. And, and that to really be able to resist that, I think is going to be like the most pastoral response enabling the medical people to then have the most effective um, response. So that's, that's part of what I've been thinking about. Um, thank you all of you who, who joined us um, for this. Um, Dr. Hill, Dr. Wagner, thank you. Um, and no, um, particularly as things heat up at, um, at Sparrow, um, that um, Meredith, that we're thinking about you a lot and keeping you in our thoughts and prayers. Um, uh, Abram, just research the heck out of all of this stuff and keep, keep working on it, please. Um, and, and if you're interested um, in, um, I believe in about a week, I'd like to host uh, putting together a conversation on the pandemic and poverty um, and, and have some interesting folks lined up for that conversation. So it's another take at what's, what's going on here. So I want to thank um, Vicki Hess and Eric Travis and Joanne Hardy for making this uh, possible, pulling this off. And if, if I might, I'd like to end us with prayer um, at a Compline and um, pretty much my favorite these days. So um, again, thank you and the Lord be with you. And let us pray, keep watch, dear Lord, with those who work or watch or weep this night. Give your angels charge over those who sleep. Tend the sick, Lord Christ. Give rest to the weary, bless the dying, soothe the suffering, pity the afflicted, and shield the joyous, and all for your love's sake. Amen. Um, we've been um, recording this, so we'll be able to post it for folks who might want to look at it um, another time. But um, thank you. Um, Dr. Hill and Dr. Wagner, thank you very, very, very much. I so appreciate you taking the time. So, bye. All right. Thank you all. <laughs>